Will you be remembered after you're dead? The Zedless Deadless podcast about obscure people from history with me, Izzy Lawrence. Hello and welcome back to the Zedless Deadless. I am Izzy Lawrence, your hostess with the mostest of the historyest of the mysteryest of things. I have an excellent episode which unfortunately has quite bad sound, but that is due to recording incidents that are beyond my control. Um, however, if you look past the bad audio quality, you will find an amazing life of facts and of a lady who I can't believe isn't supremely famous. I don't understand what anyway. Doug Siegel will tell you all about her and he is awesome and you will enjoy um, the show. So enjoy that. I do have an announcement, which is we will be on pause for a little bit. However, however, I'm making loads of history because I am going to be doing a new series of Making History on the 1st of January. It is released. You can download it from then, um, either on iTunes, if you look up Making History or on BBC Sounds. Please do that. Um, it is a series which we are very proud of. We're making it right now. And yeah, if you can do whatever you can, feedback, reviews, just give it because that is going to mean that uh, we get recommissioned and I get to make more history shows, to be honest. But also, it's going to let us know what you think, how we can make the show better. And also, um, oh, it's just so hard to make a show better when you've already given it five stars. But um, no, any feedback would be really, really welcome. Um, so look for Making History. You can find out all the projects I'm in uh, if you go to izzy.com, that is I-S-Z-I.com. A big thank you to everybody who's donating. You are fabulous, wonderful people. You are going to heaven if I were in charge. Um, you are earning brownie points and that is all that matters. Dib, dib, dob, dob. So now let us look at a life which, I mean, talk about, I reckon she murdered people. That's all I'm saying. I think she killed them. I do. That is my personal gut opinion. Um, historical facts might not bear that out, but enjoy as Doug Siegel explains a life worth living. So, this is a story that spans 11 countries, three continents, two horse whippings, three marriages, four dead lovers, one king, one revolution, and a bear. A freaking bear. This is the story of Lola Montez, who I think is just incredible. I have cheated, I have bent. Is his rules to the point of breaking because although this person isn't clearly isn't famous, because none of you know who she is, she was famous during her lifetime, but has been absolutely forgotten. Uh, and I just think she's incredible. And she was she was Beyonce before there was Beyonce. She was the material girl before Madonna. She is amazing. I think we're gonna love her. So that was the first time I heard about Lola, and I want to know about the first time you heard about her. Where did you discover this? In your talk, you talk about going to the hotel she stayed in. Was it there? That would be the cool answer, wouldn't it? But the genuine answer is, I first learned about Lola Montez via the Flashman books. You know, like the original Tom Brown School Days, like it was an old book nobody really knew even when I was a kid. It was fairly obscure, but it was about bullying in public schools. And the antagonist of that was a young bully called Flashman. Famously, this is where the idea of toasting uh, crumpets between the bullied kids' buttocks against the fire in the sixth form common room kind of thing, and like them having to kind of polish their shoes and that. So that book about that. I've never read that book, but there's a series of books about the antagonist who was Harry Flashman, and he's the anti-hero in them. He's this coward and bully that always finds himself in the centre of interesting events and somehow manages, despite his cowardice, his ineptitude and everything, just to luck out. And she was in that, because these books, they're set in a historical setting and they're meticulously researched. So what I found incredible about her was she was this woman that was kind of like, I'm a woman in a man's world, I'm not happy with that, I should have the same freedoms that, that men have. She was in there, and in there they followed her life through a bit, tangentially, right the way through to this town in America. So that piqued my interest, and so when we did a little road trip in America, I made us go to this town. <laughs> <laughs> Grass Valley in Nevada. She was born in Ireland. She was actually not remotely as like her name, Lola Montes, would suggest. She was born Eliza Gilbert in County Sligo, and uh, she came from really good stock. Um, her granddad was M MP for Kilmallock. Her mum was a lady called Liza Oliver, who married a soldier. Soldiers bigger, big in Lola's life. And they gave birth to Sola in, uh, sorry, to Lola in 
1821, where they immediately start, there's going to be a big pattern for her, where she just starts moving. They take her from there to Liverpool. She's uh, christened in Liverpool. From Liverpool, she zips off straight to India, where her dad promptly dies, her mum remarries, and then they decide, we can't possibly have her here. And at the age of four, they ship her back on her own to Scotland. Within four years, she's been Ireland, England, India, Scotland. She gets sent to be brought up in, in Montrose in Scotland, where she causes trouble. So she gets in trouble for running through the streets naked. How old is she at this point? Four she can't years be... old. Um, <laughs> it's fantastic, isn't it? Um, this isn't like from like some flowery biography, man. This is from like the correspondence between the man looking after her and her mother. Yeah. <laughs> it's like this is factual. With him going, what have you sent yeah. me? This yeah. hell child. Another occasion, she uh, she stuck flowers into the with an elderly man without him noticing during a church service. So like she stays there until she's ten, and at ten. They think, OK, let's try and do something with this wild child. So they send her to a school in Sunderland. Within two years, there's a letter saying, we've decided to send her to a more sophisticated school in Bath. Now, for those of you not familiar with um, geography of the UK, that is a long yeah. way. <laughs> I mean, today, driving, that's at least sort of five hours, if not more. And then it would have been by train and by or by horse and cart. And oh, God. So her mum at this point, she starts scheming to marry off to a richer, older man out there in India. So to avoid that, she elopes with a army lieutenant, a guy called Thomas James. And they move in 1837. So she's about 16 now. And they elope off to India. And they get to Afghanistan three years after that. So she's 19. When they're in Afghanistan, he leaves her for another woman. Oh! I know, right? So she jumps on the ship back to the UK. By the time she's gone back to the UK, he's now sued her for divorce on account of her having an affair on the boat. Um, <laughs> James wins what they called a judicial separation on the grounds of her adultery during the voyage home. Oh, really? You know, good for her because he's left her for another woman. She's a young girl. They've gone to India, then Afghanistan. He goes, you know what? I'm moving on. But they divorce on the grounds of her adultery, which is horrific. So anyway, this is the point at which Lola appears because she wasn't born as Lola. So at this point, she's still operating under her, her real name, which is Marie Dolores Rosanna Gilbert. So what she does is she thinks, I've got to look after myself. So she goes out and she takes dancing lessons in Spain. She's a bad actor. She can't sing. She's too old at this point for ballet. You know, she's now like 23, something like that. So she goes away and she learns to dance in Spain. She comes back and reinvents herself as Maria Dolores Montes. I love that. I know it's beautiful, I isn't it? I love the fact that she can get away with just going, oh, yeah, I'm Spanish. Do you ever have fantasies? Because is Doug Siegel your real name or is it your stage name? I'm the only person I know who has a stage name, which is just where people get my real name wrong. You've got it right, Doug Siegel. Everybody else, when I've been announced on TV or anything, goes, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, Doug Siegel. Well, that's because you've got that, you know. Yeah, that pizzazz. <laughs> you look like you do Aikido. That's all that means. <laughs> I am very hurt by the suggestion that I look like Steven Seagal. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was all right when he was running down a train ever so slowly. I mean, he's not that unhandsome a man. <laughs> His movies are fun. They are this sort of toxic masculinity where I'm just like, that's a really unhappy way to live your life, dude. My favourite scene of his is when he starts a fight in an anger management class. <laughs> and you're just, And you're just like... I get the point you're making, but ultimately, this is a bad thing to do. <laughs> I've managed to avoid his entire oeuvre, but I am aware of his work. But have you have you ever um, considered changing your name and just sort of like etch a sketch in your life like she did? Oh, I mean, who hasn't? I mean, it's a genius move, isn't it? And particularly, you think this is 1843. Mm. Women were either an unmarried maid or married or a widow or nothing. There was nothing for you. You were destitute. If you were divorced, you were in a hopeless situation. So I think it's just amazing that she took charge of her life like that. So she went from being known as, as Eliza James and she comes back and she tells the world that she is Maria Dolores Montez and that she was snatched from her cradle by gypsy and that's where she learned her exotic dancing. 
And she just, at this point, I think it's the only weapon, weapons, perhaps not the right word, but the only leverage women had at that point was their, their, their sexuality and their charm. And she kind of went, you know what? I am going to weaponize this and I'm going to make my way in this world. So she kind of, she got in with, at that point, the Earl of Malmesbury, who in turn leans on a theatre manager called Benjamin Lunley. And so they organized her debut in June 1843 and incredibly can you imagine this as a performer so this person appears out of nowhere and the next day she's in the national newspaper check this out for some serious objectification on saturday next the dance soon makes her appearance she's a spaniel with black eyes taper ankles and clear olive complexion which realizes all of our fantasies for pure andalusian beauty <laughs> it's really creepy she performed, she's a massive hit. The next day, the same paper says the dancing of the fair scenarios was so novel that for a time, the audience in their surprise forgot to clap. <laughs> now that's happened to me. <laughs> I braved it out too. <laughs> but it doesn't go well for long because, you know, it's a big deal. This is an etching of it happening at the time. But unfortunately, on about the second or third night, somebody in the crowd goes, Hang on, that's Betty James! Um, and she gets discovered and there's a huge scandal in the papers about it. So the scandal blows up, and you know, why should this be a scandal, really? Well, I suppose there is the whole thing of the assumed identity, but I feel that was slightly false on her. So she, she, she decides she's got to live, flee England, so she goes to Paris. Immediately, she becomes friends with all of the kind of great writers at the time. She becomes really close friends with George Sands. She becomes friends with Alexander Dumas. And then she has an affair with France Liszt. Now, at this point, France Liszt is basically the biggest rock star in the world. He is huge. And also, look up a photo photo of France Liszt. Is he sexy? is fucking hot. He <laughs> is smoking hot. And at this point, Lola's 23, and so is she. And they become this incredible couple, but it's an affair. And at the same time, Franz is like this horrific player. He's got lots of women on the go and a wife. So she has relationships with other people. And one of the relationships she has is with Alexandre de Jarier. And he is the editor of a big newspaper called Le Presse. So again, she's done the PR thing for herself. She's gone off and she has tried to find a way of insinuating herself with the press. But the brilliant thing is to pick up and pull the Jarier, she stages a fake horse riding accident so that he can come and rescue her and be sort of a, her knight in shining armour. My goodness. That is playing to a, a man's soft spot right there. <laughs> I've never gone that far. I have, after a night out, said, um, actually, uh, is it all right if I come back and use your um, <laughs> facilities before I get the train it's home? It's very similar, isn't it? And they're not taking the train <laughs> home. Hmm. It works. It's very similar, and it's much easier and less dangerous than falling off a horse in front of them. So, yeah, so she she becomes then the, the lover of this guy. He relaunches her career. She has a career on the stage in Paris. And then he is shot in a duel later that same year. There's uh, some contention on what the duel was about, but a lot of people believe the duel was about Lola. And he was kind of wow. defend, either defending her honour or it was it was a rival lover. So that's fine. She just moves on. Uh, she moves on the same year. She arrives in Munich. And this is where it gets interesting. She impresses and becomes the mistress of King Ludwig I of Bavaria. A lot of what I'm saying is stuff that I've, I've researched and I believe to be absolutely true, or as true as we can find out about anyone. What I'm going to say next is a rumour. So I don't know if this is true. I want it to be true. Therefore, it is true. That is how truth works. Absolutely. So my understanding is uh, Ludwig went to see her on stage, asked to meet her backstage. And Ludwig, I get the sense he was, let's say, a bit of a dick. Um, <laughs> He, he asked her in public, backstage, around him by all of kind, all of his uh, courtiers and, and all the people backstage, if she had boobs were real. Yeah, you know, I mean, literally, you know, wow. he, he's, he's dude bro king, isn't he? He's like, is that a real rag? So she just tore her top off and said, is that really enough for you? Um, <laughs> by the way, lads, and I, I imagine my audience is full of lads, that doesn't work every time. Oh, man. But, you know, even then, she's in control. That's not a submissive thing. That's a, you know what? You're asking me? Check these babies out, you know? I think and yeah. I think that's, that's, that's okay. So that was 1844. She takes up with uh, Ludwig. Within three years, he's made her Countess of 
Lansfield. Who knows what that means, but it, it means she's a Bavarian countess at this point. And she kind of really influences him. Bavaria at this time is a very conservative, very illiberal uh, society. And she was very much a, a liberal type person, very forward thinking, very progressive. So she convinces Ludwig to sack his conservative ministers and even an entire ministry and replace them with progressive figures. She has this enormous following amongst the university of sort of young progressive students. And I think they were called something like the Lolorettes or something. I mean, it was like a mass fan club mm-hmm. amongst them. But it, it kind of created this, this internal conflict within the country of like the one side of the country it's 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 really weird it's hard to imagine a country split but there's there's, there's almost a civil war there, there's certainly a revolt and the finger is firmly pointed at lola for stirring this up ludwig is forced to abdicate and, and lola flees bavaria march 1848 she's not even been there she's been there four years and all of this has happened tumultuous i know times. but she's always at the heart of them right and Imagine that a woman in the 1840s being at the heart of political change, for for better or worse. That's incredible. And she's done that through sheer force of will and nothing else. You know, she she would have, just from what we know about her and her throwing herself off horses at the feet of men, she would have arranged that meeting with uh, with Ludwig and gone, do you know what? I'm going to do something here to really impress him. And then that opportunity happened and bam, out came the girls, you know? But she's, yeah. she's clearly not dumb, you know? She's, she's wielding political power as best a woman can in the 1840s. And in a really short space of time, and whilst she was on the losing side i think it's incredible that she was able to do that and i love her for that alone and and then she goes to america is that right there's a little bit more to go she moves around evil oh my goodness from bavaria she moves to switzerland she spends some time hanging out in france and then she moves back to london that same year she marries again because she loves a man in uniform she marries another army uh, officer called george trafford hill she spots him in hyde park and essentially just chats him up he proposes with an week woohoo but turns out the marriage is bigamistic because oh, no. they they only had a separation you know from from a first marriage and it becomes a huge thing they're arrested for bigamy they're not arrested and thrown in jail but they're arrested for it they have to go to court the press go absolutely mad so they, they leave the country they run away they go to france then they go to spain and two years after arriving in spain husband two drowns under mysterious circumstances <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just nobody knows why. There's, there's no real inference or anything, but just like they move, the next thing you hear about them at all is that George Trafford Hill has drowned. The year after that, she arrives in New York. She steps off of the boat dressed as a man with boots with spurs on, carrying a riding whip. And I just think that is so cool as a statement. Yeah. That's again, I kind of I keep referring her back to people like Madonna and Beyonce. She reinvents herself. She, you know, she decides, right, okay. Okay, I'm going to have a new image. This is it. This is a new world. I'm going to be a new kind of woman. I think she's wonderful. Absolutely love her. So she goes to the USA. She tries to revive her career. Uh, she starts touring the Eastern United States and does quite well. She's got a play she's doing called Lola Montez in Bavaria. <laughs> <laughs> which is like I've created this incredible political situation and now here's a play about it which just show that that's a big enough title that she's that well known that she can sell it out just right. on that you get an idea of why haven't we heard of her I think she's one of these figures that's been buried and forgotten but at the time she was a, this enormous enormous star at the very least she was this enormous infamous celebrity depending on your viewpoint and you know I think the reason we don't know about her is she's exactly the sort of woman that until recently history wanted us to forget. That's what I think. And that's why I love her. So she then pitches up in San Fran. She gets uh, satired in the press and there's a song called Who's Got the Countess about what a racy chick she is and how she sleeps around because apparently that's a bad thing. (laughs) It's fine if guys do it. So she gets married again. Guess what her new husband does for a living? Well, it's San Francisco, so he works in Silicon Valley. No, hang on. He's a newspaper man. Of course course he is. Once again... She gets herself embedded in the press. So it's uh, a newspaper called the San Francisco Whig. And there's a guy called Patrick Hull. And they move to Grass Valley. Now, Grass Valley is incredible. These days, it's a really sleepy little town in a part of California. No one visits. Apart from mad comedians. Apart from me. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, it's exactly what you see on the shows. There's a soda fountain inside the drugstore, and I wanted to see her house. Now, her actual house, I think it got burnt down a fire or something in the 1920s, but, but it's been recreated exactly as was on the site. And it's the only property she ever owned in all of her life. She moves to the Grass Valley. She gets a pet bear. <laughs> because that's what you do. Again, obviously, she gets divorced from Pat Hull. In this divorce, there's a doctor who's named as kind of the, the saucy party that Lola's been getting on with. He is murdered, and nobody knows who by. That's so dodgy. That's like the second one. I know, right? Is she killing people? Is she evil? I don't know. It's possible. It is possible, <laughs> isn't it? A lot of stuff happens around her, but a lot of good stuff happens too. So within Grass Valley, one of her neighbours, a little six-year-old girl called Lotta Crabtree, she mentors her, she teaches her to dance, she teaches her to sing. Lotta Crabtree goes on to be one of the biggest stars of the late 1800s, just at the point where radio's kicking off and stuff in America. And Lola Bonte has got her started. One of my favourite incidents that happens is the editor of the Grass Valley Telegraph is a guy called Henry Shipley. He wrote a big series of articles, basically slut-shaming Lola because of you know, her previous reputation. Meanwhile, Lola claims Shipley turns up drunk at her house begging for a booty call, basically, and that this is a vendetta because he keeps turning her down. He writes this article. This article is the final straw. She grabs a horse whip, sets off down Main Street until she finds Shipley drinking with his friends in the bar of the historic Holbrook Hotel, and she has a whip fight with him. She busts his lip open and then she kind of just lets loose with this torrent of abuse that the paper says made the town's miners blush. And that is what should happen every time a man tries to slut shame a woman that turns him down. I don't know. I think that you're going to have quite a lot of men hoping to be turned down because <laughs> there's quite a few men. <laughs> who like a bit of... <laughs> yeah, maybe you're right. It's a really cool image, though. I mean, even though it is terrifying to be on the yeah, other end so of that. It's so cool to go, you know what, I'm going to do something about it. Uh, and, I say, and the time she was doing it, that's an incredible thing. There's still more with this woman. It's incredible. She meets this guy called Noel Folland. He becomes her lover and her manager, and they lead to tour Australia. He brings his wife with her. At this point, she doesn't know. And they travel on the brilliantly named... USS Fanny Major, <laughs> which arrives in Sydney. That's so good. Because Fanny is even rude in America. I mean, it's not quite the same thing, but it's still like, imagine calling your boat ass. <laughs> yeah, ass major. Wasn't he prime minister? No. <laughs> So she arrives in Sydney, and this is where kind of thing she's famous famous for as an artist happens. And there's the first mention in print of Lola Montez's erotic spider dance at the Theatre Royal in Melbourne. What the spider dance is, is she wears a sequence of petticoats. And she, in, within the context of the, the play of the dance, she notices there's a spider in her petticoat. So she lifts up a petticoat and throws it out. And eventually it says, this is one final actual quote, it says, raising her skirt so high, the audience were able to see she wore no underclothing at all. Now that was probably a lie, because she wore skin colored tights. <laughs> but even so, this was a pretty saucy kind of dance. Uh, the next day, the Melbourne Argus thundered that her performance was utterly subversive to all ideas of public morality. So in like, you know, genteel Melbourne, it's a problem. So they go off to like the Gold Coast where all of the diggers are. And in Castle, Maine, she had a massive encore off the spider dance in front of 400 miners who apparently showered her in gold nuggets. Ouch. <laughs> and, and I can't imagine you've got anywhere to go because if you're pretty much nude by the end of it, Where'd you exactly. go from there? <laughs> so at the end, that's fine. What do you, what do, you do with the encore? Maybe you put the stuff back on. <laughs> I don't know. And then you've got the Ballarat whip incident. Yet another newspaper. There's a guy called Henry C. Camp who writes for the Ballarat Times. He described her as having the form of a woman combined with characteristics of a man. And then argued, it's wrong to make much of a woman whose disregard of moral right has been the strongest and the most public kind. So he turns up at the United States Hotel where she's staying and she's She's performing next door to Victoria Theatre and Lola sees read about this, this, this article yet again, kind of criticising her. So again, she grabs her riding whip and it says, laid it on with hearty goodwill. Mr. Seacat retaliated with a riding crop and before long, the combatants had each other literally by the hair. 
Isn't that brilliant? <laughs> I think that performers horse whipping newspaper editors is a tradition we should revive. I wish I could have done it before Paul Dacre left the Daily Mail, if I'm honest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, Sea Cat was, was basically slagged her off for spider dance, and she claimed it was a Spanish national dance, <laughs> and she charged the paper with libel. But before she could follow through with the libel suit, Folland, her manager's wife, who had followed them out to Australia, had found out about the affair, beats her up, and she can't work through a month. Whoa. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, 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 that's not a minor no. beating up. She gets well. She and Folland sail for San Francisco. As they go past the coach of Fiji, Folland mysteriously goes overboard and is lost forever. Okay, so that's the second one that's been done by drowning. She's got a pattern. I can't help but think, and I hadn't really thought about it until you brought it up. Maybe she not only is this incredible feminist icon and almost visionary performer, perhaps she is also a colossal serial killer. It looks that way, Doug. I I mean... I'm not. I'm not suggesting that she isn't almighty and powerful, but I've been out with a few people. None of them have died. <laughs> I think the sobering point you're making is here, and we should always remember is that there is always a downside to serial murder. So now she's husbandless again, yeah. or yep. loverless. She sails to San Francisco. He goes overboard. She tries to do a showbiz comeback in America. That fails. So brilliantly, she reinvents herself again, and she delivers a series of moral lectures in Britain and America. Moral lectures, right? She does this sharp U-turn written by the guy that becomes her PR, who is the reverend, who's not a real reverend, Charles Chauncey Burr. Then we get to November 1859. The Philadelphia Press says she's living quietly uptown. She doesn't have much to do with the world's people. Although she talks beautifully of her present feelings and way of life, she generally, by way of parenthesis, takes out a little tobacco pouch and makes a cigarette or two for herself and her friends and falls back upon old times or decided gusto and effect but she doesn't tell anybody what she's going to do what she was actually doing during that time was she was visiting and working with fallen women in the magnum asylum workhouses they're made to work in these laundries under appalling conditions people just go missing it's horrible but she's actually working with them trying to make their lives better and then we get to 1860 she's 38 and she has a stroke out of nowhere and she's partially paralysed. Gosh, it's terrifying. Look how much she had done in those 38 years, though. And incredibly, although we'd have never heard of her, right? There are two lakes and a mountain named after her in the part of County in California. And still, if you ask Americans, they've never heard of her. I mean, this is the thing, Doug. If you can't behave, you know, in a certain way... Otherwise, you get forgotten. But what was what was it? Trump said nasty women. I bought myself one of those Hillary Clinton badges because they just say nasty women make history, and I'm just like, yeah, yeah, I do, I do make history. I make history podcasts. Yeah. So. You do, but Lola did, and they covered her up. I think she's amazing. I mean, in many ways, Lola was a woman ahead of her time, and yeah, her, her behaviour could be shocking. And she was vain. She was arrogant. She was temperamental. When she was violent, she was possibly, possibly a murderess. murderess. But I think driving much of that was just her indignation and not been allowed the same personal freedoms as men. And we're still debating that today, a century and a half later. And a century and a half ago, acting on desire was unthinkable. And I just think, just for simply acting on that belief in a space of such opposition, I think that Lola demands our admiration and she deserves to be your, your patron figure. So you can find me online where I do lots of silly things and do lots of silly memes and stuff, mostly on Facebook. So it's facebook.com forward slash Doug Siegel Live. And that's all one word, Doug Siegel Live. You can find me on my website, which is dougsegal.co.uk. I'm on Twitter as Doug underscore Siegel. I'm doing my triple award-winning show, How to Read Minds and Influence People, at the Harrogate Theatre on Saturday, the 6th of April 2019. So a big thank you to Doug Siegel. Yes, this might be the last Deadlist Deadlist in a little bit. Hopefully, um, I'm having a lot of help uh, from my Seti Sopo uh, co-presenter, Mr Simon Dunn, who is um, helping me out a lot organising my outside projects outside Radio 4's Making History and he is doing a sterling uh, job. So hopefully we might be able to release a few Z-List, Z-List episodes. The advent calendar will be on izzy.com, that is I-S-Z-I dot com, where you can catch up with fun little facts in history. Uh, that should obviously be starting at advent calendar time, which is the 1st of December. Um, 
and obviously do check out Doug Siegel. Other than that, guys, please listen to Making History on New Year's Day. It's on every Tuesday until March. And, yeah, some of the stuff we're doing is just crazy and fun. I get to go to Greenwich and the Stonehenge all in the first episode. And just, yeah, keep in touch, guys. I, you can find me on Instagram, on Twitter. I am currently writing a book, currently writing another book, currently making a Radio 4 show, and I've got the British Museum member cast, and hopefully I'll be putting out little mini episodes of the ZS Dead List. But like I say, go to izzy.com, have a look, and check out the advent calendar. Boom! So I will see you guys next year. Cool.